Pfarr. Right. <lacht> That's right, folks. It's another episode of Sonic Talk. It's episode number 398, just two or 400, which is a big number, no matter which way you look at it. We did have a week off last week because, frankly, I wasn't feeling too hot. I've had uh, had a tail end of a cold and I'm still struggling, struggling a bit. So apologies if I make any fluffs or boo-boos or technical issues. I'm unlikely to be able to cope with them. It might take a little longer. But having said that, we do have a show this week. We have a full show and a fulsome chat room as well. I'd like to say, look at that. We've got... Wow, that's 123 people. That's a pretty good number for us live, seeing as the time of day that we are. What are you people doing? Haven't you got anything better to do, like work? (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, but thank you for joining us. We do appreciate it every time. I also want to say thank you to our show sponsors. Of course, Isotope are the show sponsors, and this week uh, we will be announcing the winner of the competition we ran two weeks ago because there was no competition last week. And also, um, there will be a chance to win Iris 2, which uh, I'm sure some of you will still be excited about because it's been... uh, They've been you know, giving them away like crazy on the show, so we thank them very much for their sponsorship. Anyway, this week uh, we are joined by Mr. Mark Doty from the Bob Moon Down Foundation, Automatic Gainsay. Um, Hello. How are you, Mark? Are you well? My God, look at what you've got uh, in the background there. You've, got, you've brought your credentials to your backdrop. ARP 2600. Uh, mini mode. And a mini mode. And what's the mic? That looks like a C12, but it's probably not, is it? Oh, it's a... Uh... I don't, I'm so bad with mics. I don't even. It's a uh, it's a groove tube. Ah. Uh, GT55. Okay, excellent. Okay, you've passed the first test. This is Mark's first week. Uh, I'm going to introduce you the rest of the guests, and then we're going to come back to Mark and uh, discuss, you know, what's going on in his life because we haven't had it. He's the first time on the show, and it's uh, great to have him. We're also going to flip over to Mr. Rich Hilton, who uh, is. Uh, been on the road in the UK with uh, Nile Rogers and Sheik. Uh, in fact, Nile, you've been like a media whore the last couple of weeks. Everybody goes, "Oh, did you see Rich? Oh, did you see Rich?" Take your part. <laughs> did you? Oh, Mark Rich, I think you might be on the wrong mic. You might need to just fix that. So I'll just go ah. and say hi to uh, yes. Dave Spears, who's over there in his synth cave at G4 Software HQ in a bunker underground somewhere. Well, it's not. He's got a window. He's, he's gone yeah, up in finally. the world. He's gone up a floor. <laughs> up two floors, even, possibly. Dave Spears, of course, um, the synth master of uh, G4 Software. How are you, Mark? Uh, Mark, Dave. See, I told you I was going to blow it this week. I already... <laughs> it's just going to be like this for the whole show. How are you, Dave? Anyway, you well? That's fair enough. Yeah, yeah, I'm good. Yeah. Excellent. Yep. Glad to hear it. And uh, you had a holiday and everything, so uh, you should be... Not familiar. really a holiday. Ah. I had a weekend break, but I went to see a gig... And flew German wings. That's quite. That was. Wow. Yes. That's quite exciting. That's quite. Yeah. That's like British gallows humour as you're queuing to go on the plane. Yeah, I can imagine. It really Crikey. was. Of course, that's so, a yes. terrible tragedy. But um, anyway, I'm glad you made it there and back. I'm sure they do. They put a little bit of extra extra into the meal and stuff because I imagine you know they probably <laughs> want to make people feel more comfortable and you know what have you. Given the... I gotta say, as an as a because it's supposed to be a budget airline, isn't it? I believe so. And it. The, like the leg room was amazing. Everything about it was amazing. Excellent. The fact that I was the only person on the flight was probably even more amazing. <laughs> Excellent. There you go. Very good. Well, we should probably uh, be careful exactly where we go with that humour, but, you know, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Anyway, ah, I heard I heard a fruity tone from Mr. Rich Hilton over there in Connecticut <laughs> when, there. Again, I say, I beg your pardon. I'm sorry, I'm delirious. <laughs> How are you, Rich? Rich, so you've been you've been over in the UK doing a ton of stuff with Sheik. You're on Jonathan Ross, which I missed. I can't believe it. And I saw there was something else which I was going. Oh look, where's the, where I was trying to see where Rich was. It was um, man, I can't even remember. My my brain is addled. There was a whole bunch of stuff, a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. So you were really kind of going for it because that's to promote the new the new music act from Sheik, right? That's oh, right. I know what it was. It was the Voice. It was Ricky somebody or other. Ricky for, uh, brought some some people to your gig and showed you uh, and showed you what uh showed them these kind of noobs in the industry what uh how to do it and i think you were obviously involved in that uh-huh excellent and that's prime time saturday night tv in the uk you know it really is. yeah i got it i understood yeah 
I heard it's big. It's big time UK TV. It was fun. So um, you got the album out and single out. How's that all going? Singles out. The album's right. not out. Uh, singles doing very, very well, apparently, in the UK, which is where one might hope it would do well after all of that effort they put in. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it, it is. It's doing great. And we've been performing it, and it's fun to, it's fun to do. And I actually uh, have a new role in this song in which I am uh, actually triggering samples because, God bless them, Roland built tri uh, sample triggering into the bottom octave of this keyboard uh, off a USB drive. And there are certain aspects of the record, like spoken voices, that have to be pretty much what they, you know, me doing it or you doing it wouldn't be the same as the one from the record. Gotcha. And so there's a couple of things that, and a few synth swoops that just, there's no other reason in the entire show to support synth rigs in this gig. Um, so a couple of noisy synth swoops up and down at various tempos uh, occur also from that octave. So I'm now in the synth triggering business as well as the ah, singing. Cool. So what's um, what's the single called again? Give it a plug. Available on iTunes? Uh, the single is called I'll Be There. Excellent. And, and indeed you are. And here you are. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> I, I was just curious, actually. Um, how do you find... Because um, I've worked with band, you know, bands where there are you know really uh, able keyboard players who part of what they have to do is to trigger stuff in time. Uh, and I don't, you know, generally speaking, in previous sheet gigs, you've just been on keys duty. Do you find it kind of, is it trickier or is it because you're, you're having to think differently if you're triggering phrases than playing actual notes, right? I'm triggering uh, whole samples. So right. I'm not actually, all I have to do is get the note on in the right rhythm and I'm cool, you know, kind <laughs> of thing. So, uh, I mean, having to map a non-musical event across an octave and two keys in my mind and remember where they are came pretty quickly because I mapped them the way I thought they made sense. So right. it, there is some degree of logic, at least to me, which is the only person to whom it needs to be logical. That's true. So uh, it worked. Excellent. You know, I got it down pretty quickly and uh, tweaking the locations of where they should appear by, you know, mere 16th notes and shit. And it's all fine. It's good. Excellent. It was fun. Good. Well, I'm glad to hear that, Rich. And of course, we have over there in Bristol, Mr. Gaz Williams, who's uh, who's small. Ah, le he's less beardy this week than perhaps in previous weeks. How are you, Gaz? I, I, yeah, I'm really good. And you know, I'm excited that Mark's on the show. And I was thinking about this because uh, his automatic gainsay uh, YouTube um, channel is so phenomenal. But I was thinking there was something slightly. Mm, kind of slightly uh, okay. enticing about his videos. And I was thinking, what is it? And I started to realise his deep love of the of the things that he's displaying. It's almost like like listening into someone describing a lover and all the things that sort of get the lover going. And it's a little bit naughty to listen to it, you know, but it's really fascinating all the same. It's almost as if, you know, this is the stuff that you have to find out for yourself and you're being divulged these little secrets. And, you know, to be honest, this is, you know, 99% of the things I'm not going to be able to get my hands on <laughs> were... <laughs> But uh, it's such a brilliant, such a brilliant series of videos. I just wanted to say, yeah, big thanks and cool. uh, yeah, cool. keep them up. <laughs> Excellent. Well, Mark, thank that's, you, guys. That's, that's, that's awesome. That sounds like technoerotica. If there is actually a genre, <laughs> I think there should be one now. I think we have maybe created one. Maybe I dare you to put technoerotica in your keyword tags in the next video. Just I will be checking just to see. I'll do it. I'll, I'll bet your traffic will increase. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mark, um, as we have you here, I mean, obviously, one of the big things that you are involved in is the Bob Moog Foundation. And that's something, you know, that's your kind of day job now, right? Which must be really awesome and cool. So just give us a little bit of a, a kind of uh, brief outline of what it is that involves. Uh, well, it's hard to call it a day job, although technically that is what it is, because, I mean, it's it's like the most perfect position for me because it's all the things I would be doing if I wasn't at work, which is, uh, it's, it's kind of impossible, uh, to actually be working there, but I, I feel very fortunate and I'm lucky, but, um, what we do is we promote and preserve the legacy of Bob Moog. Obviously all of you guys, uh, have a pretty good grasp on the impact of Bob's work. Um, 
but uh, when he died, uh, the foundation was formed and we decided to, because so many people had been so moved by his work and inspired and not just like, oh, because I like synthesizers, but because uh, he was an inventor that took his ideas and put them forward and they became inspirations to people who weren't even musicians. And that's a really powerful thing that should keep going. So basically what we do is we take uh, Bob's legacy and pre preserve his history and then bring it into the now by doing things such as uh, we have our hallmark uh, curriculum, Dr. Bob Sound School, which we are trying to spread across America, teaches second graders uh, the science of sound. Uh, which is a blast, and it's it's being very well reviewed. Uh, we just recently sort of seeded it into Los Angeles, which is pretty exciting. Because well, as a city in, to in total, wow, amazing. Yes. Uh, we've primarily been in North Carolina, but uh, it's being taught to over a 1,000 students in North Carolina currently, and it's our intention to spread it across the nation because uh, using Bob's legacy to help kids learn about sound is something that Bob would have totally been into, uh, being as that he was an educator himself. Um, also, we have a substantial archive of historically fascinating uh, items related to Bob and his influence on others. And uh, we are, just recently, we uh, released um, some scans of the schematics. Ah, oh, yes, I remember seeing that, yeah. And uh, people are really excited about it. And it is exciting. It, they are the physical pieces of this history that has, you know, inspired and influenced so many people. And to actually, I mean, for me, to actually hold a schematic that was hand-drawn by Bob for, like, the 904A filter, it's like, this is, you know, this is my my foundation, my my origin right here. I'm holding it. Bob's pencil touched this paper as he was, you know, drawing this. It's amazing. It's an amazing and inspiring thing that, you know, I awesome. feel. It's kind of like the uh, notion of, uh, mu you know, seeing an original musical score, isn't it? Which is kind of handwritten in that, in that kind of sense, I suppose. It, definitely, definitely. And there are, there are always these moments where as I'm going through them, I'm making connections with them. Like uh, one of the schematics, like, it, like in this recent, recent schematic release, I put it together that this was involved in the John Cage performance Variations 5 in 1965. And to be able to make these connections between these items, it's kind of like archaeology for me. And right. it's, it's incredibly exciting and apparently inspiring to others as well. Excellent. So your role there, I mean, am I right in thinking you're kind of involved in the archive uh, and the archives and keeping that and kind of cataloging that side of things? Is that, is that a fair description? Um, my title is archive and education specialist. So uh, and it's it's pretty much a title that is true, but I also do a lot of other things as well. Uh, video and graphic design and a whole bunch of things, but primarily uh, my work is uh, associated with the education. I was one of the co-authors of the curriculum. I have a degree in education, and obviously I do have a little bit of experience uh, teaching people about stuff. <laughs> um, but uh, also, the, I am currently the head person in regard to the archives as right. well. Awesome. Awesome stuff. So um, what's the kind of... Um, do you Do you get to kind of enjoy some of the older technology as well or is it all of the kind of really cool stuff locked away and kind of carefully preserved rather than you know i mean i would understand why that would be if that was the case but do you get to play with it i suppose is what i'm asking <laughs> well don't tell my boss this but like i always come up with reasons why we need to take stuff uh out of the archives and have it around like right now sitting next to my um desk is uh, an Aries uh, modular, an Aries 300. And we took that out primarily because I'm like, oh, you know, we haven't tested that Aries yet and we should really get a grasp of whether it's working and how, what needs to be done. Nice. But really, I was like, let's get that Aries out of the archives and put it next to my desk. <laughs> but, uh, uh, so it is sitting there and it does need work, but I'm really excited uh, about what we're going to do with it once we get it serviced and operating. It ties into some of the other parts of our archives. Like we have 
two ARP 2600s in the archives and um, Dennis Collin, oh, which uh, some people may be familiar with, uh, worked on both the ARP 2600 and the Ares 300 system. And these things are all really important to us. I mean, because while we are focused on Bob Moog, it's not all about Bob Moog. It's about what Bob Bob's work influenced in other people. So, you know, all of these historical connections we can make are are beneficial to our work. Oh, excellent. And it sounds, yeah, like, I, it sounds like one of the things you also have to do is kind of come up with ways to interconnect these things and turn them into public-facing projects and stuff, which must be a great lot of fun as well, right? It really is. It really is. Uh, I mean... It's it's weird to be in a situation where it's my job to tell people about synthesizers as well as my hobby, and uh, it's it's important that I tell people about these synthesizers that I'm just dying to play, and I do get to play them. And for a long time, the Apollo, the Moog Apollo, one of maybe two in existence, uh, was sitting next to my desk, and I was playing that at, you know during breaks and. But uh, yeah, it's it's a really kind of impossible thing. Sometimes I pinch myself because it's like, well, if you could invent a job for yourself, what would it be? Well, it'd be associated with Bob Moog, and I get to teach everyone about music and science, and I get to play with all these really great synthesizers, including Moog modulars, all the time. And then you know, I get to like learn about the history, and right. that's basically what has that's happened. That's what it is. Excellent. That sounds like fun, <laughs> Dave. In, in many ways, it's kind of quite similar. You know, you, you have a, a similar work environment, perhaps. You know, I'm looking. I'm obviously, you've you've definitely trumped Mark on the workplace where he is now, but I'm suspecting the warehouse is probably can out synth you pretty much but it sounds like great fun i mean it's not not dissimilar to what you're doing in many ways no I'm both mark and i um i can't say too much but mark's been amazing on a project that i've been working on and we've communicated a lot actually over the last six months i guess and we've kind of i guess got to a point where it's like out trying to out nerd each other but i lose i do I, I, I think i probably lose on every count if i don't join in with a lot of mark's facebook conversations because they do out nerd me yeah no, that's that's so, so. Mark, mark i have to say that's that's quite an admission you heard it here folks live wow. on on the show actually excellent so what i'm um, mark i was curious also you know the stuff that you do get access to what's been the most sort of revelation in terms of like i didn't realize it could do that or sound that way what's been the, the most so of the stuff that you've obviously had been able to peruse around and mess about with? Um, well, for, I mean, it's kind of embarrassing, but uh, it's got to be the Moog Modular because I had no Moog Modular experience up until my work at the Foundation. And we have a really fantastic, Mo historically important Moog Modular um, in in our archives and being able to interact with it and mess around with it, I learned a lot of what I know about using Moog modulars. And then I was able to carry that on to like, for example, when we had Eric Norlander's Wall of Doom at NAM a couple of years ago. In fact, that you, Nick, uh, oh, yes, we you actually shot. We shot something shot. you, didn't we? Yeah, that's right. And then uh, like th this year, uh, we had Michael Boddicker's incredible modular that was used on... Uh, you know, everything pretty much in the 70s and 80s that you hear from the radio at that point. And it was nice to be able to take the experience I had with our own personal modular, which we also showed at NAM, and then apply it to uh, like Michael Boddicker's modular because there's nothing like the stress of having Michael Boddicker standing next to you while you're using his synthesizer that he used on Michael Jackson recordings. And then like, you better know what you're doing. So I, I feel really lucky that I've had the Moog Modular experience with um, our Moog Modular, um, which is actually a very early Moog Modular uh, that was purchased by Art Hunkins at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro after he took a class, one of the few classes that Bob offered in 1965. So it's like this really cool historic modular that I've got to play that has really helped me. Excellent. That sounds like I must admit I've never had the opportunity to play with a Moog modular either, apart from one of the little uh, 3C cabinets, um, which of course there will be reissues of those. But they're they're cute. They look manageable, apart from those really dumb connectors, which I don't know why <laughs> they put them on in the first place. They remind <laughs> yeah, me of true. those those really cram uh, really crappy sort of um, speaker connectors you got on 1970s Binatone hi-fi's. 
just I don't get it. I know they've got a name. You know what they are, Dave. Dave I seem to remember we talked about this before. Synth Jones. Synth Jones. Are they? Yeah. yeah. Just why? Oh, why? Anyway, I know <laughs> it's yeah. crazy, crazy business, but um, that's great. So, um, what's what's next for you, Mark? In terms of um, you know, the project that you're working. On? I mean, obviously, there's probably things you can't talk about, but what's the kind of in in focus for you at the moment? Um, in regard to the foundation, yeah. Um, currently our biggest thing that we're working on is we're having this raffle, which everyone should enter because it's a raffle for a liberation keytar, uh, which I'm going to be releasing demos. We've, we've started releasing uh, little examples of it at the Bob Moog foundation YouTube channel. Uh, but it's been really fun learning about the liberation and this raffle. I mean, everyone should enter it because I mean, it's. I, this sounds like a plug, but it, I guess it, well, is, it is a plug. plug. That's the uh, that's the way it works. Here we go. I'm just going to switch to there. It is vintage Moog right. Liberation Spring 2015 raffle. Mm. Oh wow, that's I I now I remember this. This is one of the synthesizers that I just thought. You know what? I really that's the one I want. I think it was because of Gary Newman, and I think you can pick it up though. So yeah, they're really heavy, aren't they? But it, actually, if you look at it, it looks what? a bit like one of the the, it, the Moog in the kind of realistic phase. Actually, yeah. well, first of all, let me address the weight thing. At tops, they're 14 pounds. I mean, they are really considerably lighter than you think. And uh, yeah, we have uh, we have some footage we're going to release of a, of this uh, liberation being played by Mary Francis of a band called uh, Yo Mama's Big Fat Booty Band. If you've never heard of them, they're extremely funky, fantastic. But we have all this footage of this, you know relatively petite girl toting this thing around and jamming on it. They are not heavy. 14 pounds, you could do it. I believe in you. Um, <laughs> but what, <laughs> what, was, what was your question? Oh, it, was, it, it has a look of it about um, in the sort of realistic period, you oh. know, the Radio Shack kind of period, that sort of look to it. Is it was it built around well, the same time as some of that stuff? I guess maybe. Yeah, there's this. this is more of the archaeology uh, about it because, you know, I looked at it, you know, in a, in a lot of places you'll read on the internet, it's like very similar to the prodigy, but it's really not similar to the prodigy. It basically is an MG one. Uh, it has all of the same functionality of the MG one. And then it has aftertouch, which it calls force. And then it's got all these cool ways to use the aftertouch. Uh, for example, you can use it to control the, uh, the pitch of the second oscillator. So, like when you do sync on the MG1, you're just pretty much turning the pitch knob to get the sync effect. Uh, on this, because it has this aftertouch, like you could create your own sync envelope with the pressure of your fingers. And uh, it makes it super powerful. But then I was like, I heard these stories uh, online about how the MG1 came about. And I was like, well, wait a minute. The MG1 came out after the liberation so how did that whole thing work because i thought you know the mg1 came out first but no this was a synthesizer being worked on by moog which we have schematics for uh and they called it the moog ssk and yeah. i haven't been able to find out what ssk stands for yet but uh, okay. i'll keep you updated right cool so well, is this also paraphonic then is the liberation also paraphonic the liberation is paraphonic, and no one ever talks about that either. It's it's oh. uh, polyphonic, all going through a single filter and envelope and amp. But yeah, I mean, if you you know, it's like any paraphonic synth. If you do a little bit of work, you can make it sound perfectly like a decent synthesizer, a po decent polyphonic synthesizer. How, how many so, notes? Yeah, so how many notes are polyphonic? It's divide polyphonic. down, so it's all of them. Oh wow! Okay. Interesting. I didn't know that at all. So it's fully polyphonic, right? Yes. Interesting. Hmm. Rich, you ever you ever lugged a liberation around your neck back in the day? One time. Okay. At EU Wurlitzer in Boston. One time. And yes, it was heavy, but it wasn't that heavy. It wasn't as heavy as the electric piano I had worn years before around my neck. <laughs> so in that sense, no, it's not heavy at all. That sounds like but, a punishment, uh, Rich. Oh, and at the time, it felt heavier than I had hoped it would be, but nevertheless, it was fun. And uh, and the mo I remember the realistic 
synthesizer like it was yesterday. I yet understand. I first saw Dr. Moog speak in 1975 at Cornell University and uh, got a feel for the person because I was in a room with 20 other oddly interested people because today it's not so odd. But then it was oddly interested people who wanted to know everything they could about this amazing guy who had built these great instruments. And... Uh, had a, a lot of early experiences with a lot of early Moog keyboards. Used to play Mini Moog number eighty nine on gigs. Uh, studied oh, at sub one hundred. That's pretty cool. Wow. Studied at Cornell where they had modular number three. Uh, attended my friend's uh, class at uh, Albany uh, SUNY at Albany, which had like f I think it was four refrigerator sized racks of modules next to each other. Um, and this was all really early for me. So. I quite, I quite easily remember the appearance of all of these various stages of gear that are now looked back upon so fondly. And uh, I remember the impressions we had of them at the time, and I re-examine all of that as I see all the attention and affection that's brought to them now. But I certainly do enjoy, first of all, and admire Mark's work with the Foundation and the Foundation in general. And uh, the brief time I spent with Michelle uh, last year when we were in Asheville playing was fantastic. And... Uh, Really, really admire the educational work you're doing there, Mark, and uh, think really highly of it. Well, um, thank you. Cool. Yeah, yeah, man, and uh, and yeah, these synthesizer toys are cool, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. What, so, what was was the MG1 paraphonic as well? Yes. Oh, I know. I did not know that. But I'm just like to say, bringing it back to a more sort of base level, we're talking about uh, Technorotica and a strap-on keyboard. I mean, there's two, two key, two keywords for you right there in the YouTube video. I think I might have to use them in this <laughs> show as well. But first, I think it's probably time you all to take a little break. I'm going to say, uh, have a word from our sponsor. It's time that we uh, tell you the results of the competition from the uh, from Iris, and also a word from the sponsor. So first, a word from our sponsor. And when I press this button, sometimes there's a lag, but usually not this long. There we go, of course. Isotope Iris 2, 11 gigabyte sample library. Get started quickly with hundreds of patches because it comes with everything. These used to be just sound packs before, but now they all come as you want. You've got lots and lots and lots of oscillator WAVs, a, a massive amount of uh, modulation, intuitive spectral selection tools, as we uh, have seen with uh, Isotope Iris and also uh, the other Isotope technology. Uh, Multi-mode master filter, which takes attractive synthesis. Uh, 17 models of classic analog filters, uh, five envelopes, five LFOs, macro controls, the ability, you see there in some of these uh, shots if you're watching the video version, that the indications of what's been happening in modulation, up to four sample slots. And you hear a lot of these things actually sound pretty impressive. There's kind of, uh, because we've got effects as well. You can see the visualizations of the modulations and filters uh, for every modulated parameter. And you've got intelligent zero crossing and loop sample selection seamlessly using their intelligent zero crossing. To get your copy, you can go to isotope.com forward slash iris, uh, where you can get a 10 day free download demo which will work so i want to say thank you very much to them and also uh we have a winner uh, for last time we ran the competition uh the winner is uh, the competition you have to run on twitter uh we did do one on facebook this week just because there was no show we felt a little guilty about not having a the winner this week is someone called lompy boy uh, which is l-o-m-p-e-b-o-y at Lompy Boy, and he tweeted the hashtag Lasso Your Sound to at Sonic State and Isotope Sync, uh, uh, and added the comment Synths are still cool, uh, which is fine. Thank you very much. Anyway, so get in touch. Uh, if you get in touch with us, then the Isotope Fairy will bestow Iris 2 upon you. But we also have uh, another competition for this week, and this is the hashtag. Basically, on uh, if you go onto Twitter, you need to put the hashtag Sound Painting one word, and send that to at Sonic State and at Isotopic, if you mention those. We'll pick that up and we'll randomly pick a winner from the uh, the entries uh, via the uh, uh, random.org we use for generating a random number, and then we count up the number of numbers, and, you know, it's all, all very straightforward, if you see what I mean. So, remember, you want to win Isotope Iris 2, hashtag sound painting, to at Sonic State and at Isotope Inc. So, good luck, and uh, thank you very much for the show sponsors. Nick. Nick, can I jump in here a moment? Yes, of course you can, um, guys. Fantastic, obviously, hearing about Bob Moog. But I noticed I did discover something that is a little bit of a... Um, well, I think something that needs to be addressed really, really soon is that the great 
David Cockerell doesn't have an entry on Wikipedia. You know, whoa. Now, David Cockerell, someone I've just become aware of. And wow, this man is really important. He's he's in a teeny, teeny way, a little bit like a British Bob Moog in a way. Just, a, you know, but 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 he hasn't got a Wikipedia page. Wow. Isn't that terrible? Tell me, I, I'm outrageous. afraid I'm I'm going to have to say uh, plead ignorance on this one. Um, I, I'll put it down to my cold. I can't retrieve it. So tell us about <laughs> it, Gaz. Okay. Well, Dave, I'm sure would um, would be able to help elucidate here. He's the guy who did the actual designs of the EMS first, uh, the uh, uh, okay. and then the synth. The you know the actual engineer who kind of built these synths. He also went on to do loads of really cool electro harmonics pedals like the um small stone he did like a 16 second delay and a whole bunch of these cool ones and then is recently oh well oh i nearly missed something there the akai s900 <laughs> on the way you know wow, like, okay ah. right well fair enough. Uh, and then onwards to um to to doing a lot of recent electro harmonics pedals, which are just like the coolest pedals on the block, the hog and the pog and the ring thing, and all, the uh, memory man with Hazarai, blah blah blah. So this dude, he's been described as just being this amazing, amazing genius who can program sort of the the um, these incredible FFT algorithms with tiny amount of processing, and because I mean like those electro harmonics pedals are like fully fully polyphonic, um, you know. Uh, you just, with just a mono input, you know, really clever stuff going on. Oh, vocoder, the EMS vocoder, uh, and yeah. <laughs> okay. I no think, Wikipedia. He's got I think no Wikipedia. I think you made a very good cause. I don't know how one goes about creating a Wikipedia entry for such a chat, but I mean, it sounds like I, I remember I've used the uh, EMS vocoder. I remember it's got a great knob that's called stuffing, which just <laughs> any synthesizer that has that on it is is all right in my books. And uh, it did sound. It's a lovely sounding vocoder, but it's quite. Uh, it was quite hard to use. Have you, have you used well, that? Are you familiar well, with that parameter, Rich? <laughs> no. Was there one next to it called gravy? No. There should be though, shouldn't there? There, there maybe there should. Cranberry um, sauce. Carrier. The reverb uh, pedal is called cranberry sauce. Excellent. <laughs> well, I can't remember the exact model of the EMS. It came in like a rack, and I remember it was because uh, it was Will Gregory's, and he lent it to us, and I used it on. What did I use it on? I used it on. Crikey, I can't remember. I really can't they had remember. An AKS, they had an AKS at Cornell in the same room with that Moog modular. I oh, what, that to. Synthy, the full one? Yeah. Wow. Loved it. Loved it. Used that more than anything in the room. Loved it. That. Ran all of my friends. I would invite up, well, I had keys to the building. I would invite people up at 2 in the morning and record them through the uh, Synthy. You know, Did you have the keys eight. to the Synthy? Because quite often they had a, an ignition key, didn't they? The one that we saw at uh, um, uh, 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 one place did. <laughs> I don't recall having to use a key. In that, the was awesome. that was awesome. That was awesome. I remember because we saw one. It was when we just started doing video. I must try and yeah, dig the video sure. out. We had a um, they the guys at I, the synthesizer repair center. I forget where they were exactly. They'd restored it, and they brought it to the show. And it was, it was just. It was like the size of a kitchen. I mean, it was just crazy. It was absolutely enormous. Wow. Really beautiful. Well, the one I'm talking about, obviously, is the suitcase. Ah, what okay. they call suitcase model. The AKS Synthy uh, was touted originally as a portable synthesizer because you could basically close it up, carry it like a suitcase. And I'm pretty sure the first ad for the thing featured Ringo Starr as the uh, famous guy who was endorsing it, which <laughs> I think is pretty hilarious when you think about it technologically. But... Um, yeah, you st it was very popular to process people through it back then because of the work of Brian Eno in Roxy Music and the work of this guy Jacques-Yves Labatt in Todd Rundgren's Utopia, who had the entire band running live through his EMS system. And if you listen to live tapes of the era, you can hear individual, like whole drum kits being filtered and processed through this guy's rig live on stage in 1972 or three. It's... <laughs> So um, there was a history to this, and I was interested in exploring it. Awesome, awesome. Um, right now, I've just I've just realised that um, I was going to go on to another bit of a topic, and I haven't quite got my my thing prepared yet. Um, let's uh, let's just see where we're going to go. Uh, I think ah, um, oh, there we go. I've got that loaded up. Got a couple of things I'd like to cover. Um, first one, I think this is probably going to be right up your street, Mark. So let's start with that. This is a chap called Matt Miller, because uh, something I've been thinking about recently. You know, there's quite a lot of stomp pedals, and people are putting synth through them, and he's he's just working on getting 
turned them into Euro rack format and giving CV control to pedals that ordinarily didn't have them. And I think I think there's a market there, and I think there's more than just a market. I think it's a whole untapped world of fun that uh, could really work. And I, I think this is just modulating the, the volume. It, you can't really hear it all that well, actually. It does sound a lot better than this, but I'm not doing it much justice with that. So... The notion of CV control. I know that Moog um, had, uh, I can't remember the name of the pedal, but it was like a, a, a Moog Focus have CV input. But they're, they're, they're fine and they are what they are. But I'm thinking, you know, things like some of the Boss pedals, you know, with a little bit of modulation on the delay, you know, uh, the Strymon Big Sky. I know that, uh, Dave, you're a big fan of the Strymon stuff. We should, I wonder if there's enough juice in a Eurorack to be able to power those DSPs. Does it take a lot of juice, that Strymon pedal you've got? Yeah, they use the entire Sharp chip on it, I think. Which is a lot. That's yeah. a lot of gas. I wonder if it would need, if you'd be able to run it off Eurorack, or whether you'd have to have some sort of souped-up Eurorack thing. I don't know, that's an interesting... Mark, I mean, do you, you must kind of... Do you get people coming in, you know, just for your association with Moog, generally, kind of pitching you crazy-ass ideas like this? I've got this fantastic idea for such and such and such and such, and um, so, uh, pedals seem to be where it should be going pedals in racks um i i never have that happen actually no one ever pitches anything to me but my brother is a guitarist and he he really has gotten into that like he uh he did get a whole bunch of moger fogers and he was really into the voltage controlled aspect of it and so which surprised me because you know we were growing up it was all like Judas Priest and Iron Maiden and stuff and now here's my brother like actually engaging in synthesis you know I can't even tell you the damage I went through in the 80s when it was all the synthesizer and my brother was a guitar player and you know and I was all into the synthesizer and there was all kinds of terrible torture that occurred but anyway uh yeah I think I think guitarists might be ready for synthesis in this fashion I think it's definitely. I know Gaz, you're uh, you've been kind of really digging on the uh, sorry mod. Uh, what's the name of the pedals that you? Sonus. Sonus. That's right. Which have the yeah. ability to kind of get into that world. Though most of their stuff seems to be via MIDI, doesn't it, rather than via CV at this stage. Yeah, yeah. No CV at the moment, but I mean, uh, really, really very deep pedals that give uh, like almost synthesizer level of, you know. Uh, like LFOs and envelopes and various things, and but 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 with variable shapes to the envelopes, and you, know, you can get right in on those pedals on the Sonus. So that's the Sonus volume, which does kind of um, LFO volume effects, and the the Wahoo, which is a, a dual filter that can be configured in all kinds of interesting ways, and totally analog signal path. But with this modern idea. Well, I say modern idea. It's not a modern idea, but this modern uh, trend for digital controlled analog, which I still think is a phenomenally interesting area of of, of getting the best of both worlds. Um, so, yeah. So, but it is interesting because a lot of people with those particular pedals, because I've been really, um, you know, sort of big enthusiast of the Sonus pedals, a lot of guitarists, they do shy away from all that stuff. You know, those terms, you know, we need to kind of... We need to break them in gently. Yeah, break them down. These kind of, you know. <laughs> break it down. <laughs> it's interesting, though. There has been another uh, development because, uh, as we saw, this on Create Digital Music, we posted something as well, but uh, Peter Kern over at Create Digital Music music got more information this is the pittsburgh modular stomp box which uh, is an interesting notion this is the case and i guess the the pedals can be configured to do various things and uh that while that that looks like a great idea apart from the fact of maybe tripping over um, <laughs> on stage maybe not maybe more for the studio i mean on, on stage i think that might be a little bit uh, impractical but it's a it's a great notion i don't know rich the, the no, I mean, do you yeah. do you use pedals and stuff in, in your kind of processing of things, or is most of your, you know, in, most of your uh, recording going to be happening in the box or in the amp when you're working with guitars, for instance? Yes, to all of that. Okay. <laughs> yes, we use them. Not usually. Most, you know, but sometimes and occasionally in the box. Sometimes before the box. No, of course, obviously, but if you use it before the box, you're that's you're committed, and. Uh, People tend not to commit so easily these days to things. And uh, even when you're recording amps nowadays, you often record a direct signal off the guitar so you can reamp more easily. And, you know, there's, so there's always 
signal splits going on. But yeah, uh, yeah, sure. Sometimes if it calls for it, it looks like a it's lot. It looks totally like a lot of fun. Yeah, it looks like a lot of fun. Oh, this yeah. thing, but I, I mean, I guess going to be very hard for anybody to recall. I mean, Gaz, you know, I know you're a big ex- proponent of you no, know, that the mini setup. I mean, this kind of a would be a cool little mini modular, just the case itself. But I know how much you enjoy the. Uh, the, the kind of portable aspect to your rig. Can you see a space for this? I'm guessing this is probably going to require some kind of major power input. I can't see what the power source is on this. There doesn't seem to be anything on the actual, uh, in, certainly there. So I don't know whether or not it requires an IEC socket, which is obviously not something you really want on the... Oh, look, there we go. It looks like there's maybe some kind of a... Ah, uh, there we go. Uh, what does that say? Let's see if I can zoom in on that. This is live friends. I feel like Deckard in uh, in Blade Runner. Enhance. That looks like that says 15 volts DC, but I can't quite make it out. I don't know if anybody else knows about it. I don't know, Mark. I don't, Mark I, I'm guessing, Mark, anything that's got any kind of modular stuff on it, you're going to want to get involved in, right? <laughs> I yes, I mean I think it's fantastic. I can just imagining. I, I'm I'm trying to imagine a guitarist like kneeling on the stage patching, and it's like <laughs> yes, that's awesome. It but, need, uh, maybe it needs to be put on a on a stand or something. It looks a little bit impractical, perhaps. I don't know, Dave. What are you? Uh, sorry, Dave. That's you, Dave. You use a lot of pedals in your sit setup, and I've always thought whenever I hear a delay, if I could just modulate the delay time ever so slightly from a CV, please. That would be great. Yeah. And I just don't understand because sometimes, you know, the new boss, uh, Wazacraft DM2, has a control input for delay time, but you can't put CV into it. It has to be an expression p- p- pedal, which seems kind of crazy. It's like, oh, they were so close to that, but they didn't quite manage it. But it's an analog delay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, this is interesting. Is it this Honestly, this could go one way or the other, couldn't it? Yeah. Most guitarists I know haven't got a clue what. A mains lead is, let alone a midi lead. They know what a jack jack lead is. So yeah, I don't know about um yeah, but giving a guitarist a modular setup, it could be a license for pain. Yeah. <laughs> well, or it's... it could be really exciting. I'm not sure really. I I know a couple of guitarists I'd like to sing this stuff in front of. Let's see. And just get... see what happens. It looked... But I could certainly imagine that all manner of hell in a live situation. Yeah, I think marketing. It seems to make more sense to me in terms of marketing than, and sonically than actually the word using the word guitarist in the same sentence as <laughs> anyway. This is interesting. It looks like you've got the ability to to have different switch patches, which is kind of cool. And there's something that uh, Rob, our guitar, one of our guitar reviewers, came down with, and he's got it's this little box. I forget the name of it, and it's basically an eight input, eight output matrix with very simple logic switching. So you could just kind of go right. This button will just open up these routings we'll switch that pedal that pedal that pedal on and that seems like you know if you can start combining these things together with the ability to then have pre-hardwired uh, re-normal modules that you could actually utilize this in many different ways not just for the guitarist just to use it for actually programmable patchability in some respects i mean i know we've seen that a little bit in modulars and i don't know how people feel about that from a purist sense whether perhaps it's uh, it's 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 not the done thing is it you, you, you said the word purist, and then you went straight to my, me. I don't well, it's just you about. haven't spoken for a little while, Mark. That's all. <laughs> no, I, I'm, yeah, I, I do suffer from terrible purisms. So some of these things for me are kind of like, oh, well, you know. But I guess is what my response would be. Well, that's fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> okay. Uh, right. Uh, Gas, well, what's that? Well, we were just talking about synthy th- things on pedals. This is electron electroharmonics ring thing, which is like a ring modulator that's got a load of cool tricks up its sleeve. But the inputs you can um, you can modulate, you, you know, your sideband. Uh, well, has it got a ring mod X and Y? Uh, I think it's only. Oh, I can't remember now, but. Um, but that's a David Cockrell design as well. So just it just linked things up. But that's quite cool because you can... I've been linking that, having synth going into it and doing all... Um, having the the SQ1 essentially driving the modulator on here. Ah, so okay. So what, it can uh, trigger the... It triggers the, the, the cycle. Uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with the pedal, I'm afraid. 
Yeah, it does. Yeah, so it can and it and it can it can just go very very strange places. <laughs> That's the thing with um, modulators; they certainly can. But there's yeah. always a sweet. There's often like a sweet spot in there that just. Well, this of... one is cool though. You can press the tune on it, and it'll tune it to whatever note you're doing. So. Oh, so it becomes more sweet. musically kind of relevant. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's neat. Yeah, and you can keep your foot on it, and it'll constantly tune to you. So. Yeah, David Cockrell, see, just just giving him Cockrell his juice. was a. He was a complete genius. Peter Zanoffier refers to him as the greatest music engineer that was ever, which I'm not sure whether that's entirely true, but what happened was Zanoffier used to have all these kind of crazy ideas and Cockrell used to literally go down to these kind of army surplus stores, you know, just after the war where there was all this mad gear and he'd just kind of buy all of these weird things and then kind of give Sanofiev something, which obviously led to that, you know, huge EMS studio. So, yeah, him. But, I mean, you know, we were saying about that S900. That was Cockrell and Chris Hoggett. And I think Chris is one of the great British engineers as well. So, there you go. There's a bit of history there. Okay. Cool, yeah. <laughs> Um, right, I've got something else here. I'm just trying to find it uh, briefly, which was a... Um, I'm pretty sure there was... Uh, ah, this is the HTML5 drum machine, and we'll see this is, which is a completely different area of. Uh, of I mean, it just got me quite interested in. Uh, let me see, where is it? There, are, I think you can cl you can start playing. Let's see whether it'll work. I'll just check that out. Oh yeah, we've got an 808. I'm pretty sure I saw other models in here as well. Uh, what happens if I play that? There we go. I don't think it's got swing. But it's astonishing that basically, I mean, this is obviously a bunch of pieces, uh, samples that are just being triggered. This is HTML5, and I think uh, what's really cool about this, if I, <laughs> if I remember correctly, you can export your pattern as a WAV file as well, which is, again, you know, this is a very different uh, sort of area of technology. And I know, Dave, you've got uh, an 808, but many people don't. And it just seems like a really interesting notion that we could just kind of quickly throw down, the, take the notion of taking those some of those classic drum samples, which of course they're not going to capture the full majesty and timing of the particular drum machine, but certainly for maybe some things which are more sample based, it could be kind of an interesting idea. Be just be able to quickly dial it up, save out the patch, whack it into your production. Hey, what what could possibly go wrong? Yeah, nothing at all. <laughs> <laughs> No, it, it was, yeah. It's an impressive I mean, of piece all... of programming. Yeah. I mean, we've seen them, haven't we? Have we seen them in Flash and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah. I think we've seen them in Flash before. This is the first one. I, 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 th I don't think anybody's particularly thrilled at this concept, but uh, I just wanted to throw it in there in case you haven't seen it. HTML5drummachine.com. I liked it. It Did took it. 15 minutes out of my day. Excellent. <laughs> Want to hear? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, that's enough. Yeah, that's enough. <laughs> Anyway, there you go. Ah, cool. did you find <laughs> did you find Rich that um you did you bounce the WAV and then use the WAV or is that just playing in your browser? That's just playing in my browser. I did actually bounce a WAV, but I've worked on it since then. Um, <laughs> but it's just you know cool. You know, it's like playing a computer game to me. It's fun. I haven't used the buttons in a while, and it's an interface that I know so unbelievably deep. It's like something that you don't get to, you know, you're, you might have been the world's greatest unicyclist at one point, but you haven't climbed on one in a while. <laughs> That's what it felt like to me when I was running the thing. It's like, I used to be really good with these things, and you know, but I don't tend to use them that much in that way anymore. I tend to work in other creative paradigms. Yeah, I know what you said. <laughs> I know what you're saying. So, Mark, Mark, do you use the, the kind of TR interface? I mean, I'm guessing, you know, the, the, the kind of classic analog drum machines. I mean, are you, or when you, because I've I'm, I'm noticed that most of the music that I hear on your videos tends to have a live kind of drum element. Are you, would that be fair to say? It is. There was this thing, and I think a lot of you guys will understand this. You know, there was that period where once samplers became affordable and powerful, I, I was just like, gosh, why would I ever use a drum machine again? And I've kind of like held that viewpoint. And so like I, I have this whole deal where I will even condemn the TRs because I'm like, oh, yeah, the old drum machines. Just sample it and use it. And people are like, oh, you, you can't say that. You are the guy who's against that. But I'm just I'm not a drum machine kind of guy, although I do increasingly like uh, – Here's a secret. 
no one knows. Like I've been using Chord Gadget for some of my drums, like in demo videos and stuff, because it's, it's really fun. I mean, it's it really it's sort of bringing my joy back to the drum machine. Uh, because after the Alesis HR16, I was like, I'm using samples, and I've mostly used samples since then. So, like the idea for me of a software reproduction of a hardware drum machine within the context of a web browser, I'm just like. Too far removed. What would I? Yeah, I'm that. That's like a million miles away for me, um, which is not a criticism, but you know. Yeah, I, no, I think it's, me, about, it's, it's, it's also to do with creative process as well, to a degree, isn't it? And I think the web yeah. browser doesn't is not something that we yet, at least, um, identify with creative process. Although, having said that, I'm using you know I use uh, um, web based image editors. You know, I no longer use Photoshop for most of the stuff that I have to do on Sonic. I'm using, you know, the the, the kind of web based stuff. So it's starting to move in that direction. So it's an interesting. Mm -hmm. So how about so how about Rebirth then? Is that fun for you? <laughs> I have Rebirth never so used just Rebirth. Oh, it's actually so much fun. Well, to me, you see, to me, they it's a simulated nostalgia, and I get to remember what it's like. Those are fun gadgets to me because they were fun. That's what you had at the time, and those were your options. So you learned them by necessity, and now it's like fun. I guess there's some aspect of Stockholm Syndrome in that. I'm not sure, but... Um... <laughs> but it's interesting, though, isn't it? Because, I mean, the TR interface, the classic TR drum interface... Is of anything is kind of probably one of the things, particularly if you, maybe if you ran this on a touch screen where you could just go, bah, 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 you know, that would actually kind of make a lot of sense because it's it, it is a one part at a time thing, so there's not really all that much limitations. And if you were trying to work on a much more deeper level, maybe on a synthesizer which had lots of knobs or what have you, that might not be so cool. But I could see this perhaps working on a touch screen. I think that would make sense, you know, because then I could just quickly just reach out and and, and grab those knobs and and do what I wanted to wanted to do very quickly and I think that that's yeah. where it could be interesting no which is why they're on iPads yeah. and stuff yeah I suppose so well yeah. HTML, which is why it's HTML5 so I mean that makes a lot of sense in many ways so yeah I could see I could see maybe that might work but maybe not on the desktop it makes less sense on the desktop perhaps mm. could you I didn't really check this out could you can you program like and chain patterns and create songs and stuff? Uh, no, it it, basic... it's pretty Ooh. basic, but you can save them out. It uh, doesn't look like there's any swing on it either, as far as I can tell, which is the... It's not on the original AI either, is it? No, that's true. Because, um, and... I, I mean, I have to say, even on the hardware, I hate... I mean, I love I love the 808, but um, chaining stuff and creating songs is... Is pretty tedious. In fact, the only thing that's more tedious is that SDS six that I was showing you the other day when you were up. <laughs> Chaining a song together on that, it's just like I don't know, it's like programming in hex or some other shite. It's just horrible. <laughs> but yeah. But when but the CR seventy eight, you don't care because it I don't even think it has a song mode. Just turn bits up and down, don't you? You just play no, the you got over that... all day long. <laughs> You've got that mad program pad, haven't you, on the on the 78 that you can never get in quantized kind of quite just... In fact, we bought, <laughs> we bought Gizmo for ours, uh, which is amazing. It's like 100 euros, and you can actually program it in, choose to pick your quantize, program really? in the, into those four sections. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. It's uh, like a Czech company. Uh, and what, is that, is, that, is that memory available in the original CR to, to be able to program into then? Yeah, yeah, there are four... Wow programmable you know uh, wow. the, the, the pattern patterns and uh, yeah because originally it was just this little boinky pad that you were kind of going uh go and it was <laughs> never <laughs> ever ever in time and, uh, we, oh, anyway no, now we yeah. love that we love that boinkiness we love yeah it. We were, i i would we like just romance, but... i would like to say i did just publish the roland jdxi and i'd like to just say a kind of there is i mean we forget the kind of not really very analog side of it um you know, but fair, fair enough for at least put, putting that in. The drum side of it is really, really good. You can layer up to four sounds from that. You know, I don't know how many voices it's got in it. You can layer up to four sounds per drum and mix and match and what have you. And it, you can create some really interesting, and it's got a TR style uh, re um, recording paradigm if you want to do it in step or you just play it in. And, and I have to say, for drums, it's almost, if it was, you know, maybe a tad cheaper, it would be worth buying just for drum machine capabilities because it's got a pattern sequencer in it that's really you know it doesn't do song chain mode i suppose but but you know at least you can trigger stuff out. and I, I i'd say you know i found that i've uh, although most of the stuff i programmed was very 90s kind of uh 
uh, uh, soft focus uh, lounge music for some reason. I don't know why that is. That's not necessary. Maybe that's just it's taken me back to the sort of stuff I used to do on the D D one ten. I'm not sure, but I saw uh, that review. That was a good review. I thought, I thought I, it sounded sounded like a good machine as well. I was kind of like, yeah, mm. yeah, I'm with that. You, you know, know what, if I was I younger and didn't have tons of stuff, the, okay. the, <laughs> it's really funny because I know I post um. um Synthtopia posted it, and then the comment stream on there is astonishing. There's just all this extrapolation from my whatever my I'm sure you get the same thing, Mark, when you post videos. You know, people extrapolate all sorts of kind of hidden meaning or the fact that you kind of <laughs> somehow in the pay of some mega corp. I mean, it's just absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. You know, I don't I don't kind of I don't feel either way. I mean, but I did feel compelled to post something saying, look, guys, you know, it's it's a cheap synthesizer. I'm cheap in the UK sense of the word. That's not for everyone, but you get a heck of a lot of features for the money. And those supernatural voices are actually pretty cool. Three oscillators per voice with a, yeah. fil- a fil- different filter type on each one. For a synth that it's like, three- what's it going to be about 500 bucks? You know, that's pretty compelling reason to, you know, okay. But everybody hates mini keys and it's a Roland synth. What can you say? What's <laughs> reckon the best read? Oh, no. Maybe we shouldn't go in there. Okay. I, I had somebody who, uh, he, uh, when I did that Chamberlain video, I just had this email that was just like absolute some guy going mental because I hadn't mentioned Todd Rundgren oh, yeah. in it. <laughs> and I just replied saying, Dear Mrs. Rundgren, I'm really sorry <laughs> to have left on your son. <laughs> he was an early adopter, to be fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was completely my error, but it was like it was like sort of ten pages of kind of hate and angst. It's interesting. I just couldn't resist it. It's like it's... The temptation was just too much. <laughs> it is very interesting how that goes. I mean, you know, because uh, Mark, you do a lot of videos. Your videos, I think, be fair to say. Uh, more about the functionality maybe let you know you're not trying to kind of review it because most of the stuff that you're dealing with is not necessarily new although i know you're waiting for the art per odyssey to come did you get yours yet i'm actually being interested to think what, what you oh, make of it has it has it arrived that's where you're gonna go with this i see yeah <laughs> like doesn't everyone in england have one now no um i just talked to korg last night and i was like dudes and i have been assured that i'm going to be getting one but yeah i i do get the same thing people like people do say that i am in the pocket of the companies and that that's why i say all the good things i do and i'm like well i mean i demonstrate everything i say right there so i can't really make it up and i can't make it better than it is because i'm actually yeah. doing it or worse than so, it is yeah or, right i mean very rarely am i like wow this part of this sucks um, because I only demo since that I'm really interested in. So I, I never, I, de- I pursue companies. And I'm like, Hey, your synth, this is super cool. And I want to do it. And they go, okay. And then I do it because I like it, but I don't really demo since that I don't like. So, well, it's, easy. Yeah, it's, it's I, harder to get a musical connection going with something that is just really crummy. I mean, this is the one thing that I was kind of pointing out as well. This is getting a little bit of um, inside synth reviewers, which is a, basically a panel discussion consisting of two people <laughs> who do it <laughs> on video for YouTube. That's me and you, Mark, basically. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it, it's... you. D- it's so easy with the sort of anonymity of the internet to kind of get all bitchy and horror about, about stuff. But if I've got something that comes in the door uh, that's been sent, perhaps, from whoever, and it really sucks, I'll say, I, I can't say enough good things about this thing. I don't think it's go- there's not going to be anything positive for me to say, you need to fix this stuff because it's, not, it's no good, you know. And I try and turn it into a positive rather than me just kind of go, well, I haven't got anything good to say about it. Everything's rubbish about it. I don't know. Rich, you look like you were about to jump in there. Well, I was. Uh, some people embrace the crummy. Yeah, They're absolutely. They're crummy. And furthermore, yesterday's crummy becomes today's romance. Yeah. So, and I've seen it happen a million times, and I could list them for you. People are paying ridiculous dollars for these things that I didn't want when they were released. Mm-hmm. So, you know, people and people get great results with things that I can't work with. So I, I don't think there's anything empirical about that crummy equals no creativity at the output thing. I don't... I don't know about no, that. No, I agree. I mean, I, I have think problems there. 
but it's important to try. I mean, you know, whatever you're reviewing, you want to try and apply some sort of creative process to it. So it's like, oh, look, I did some cool stuff with this. Therefore, it's good for this. It might not be so good for that, but it does this okay. You know, that's the kind And of... you'll make something that's completely unlike most of the rest of what you do because of the limitations of the... Yeah, yeah, I think um, that's true. That's fair that's, to say. That's quite cool, actually. Yeah. I like... But it's difficult. I know, Gaz, I mean, you've, you've done some reviews for us as well and, and found... You know, in a couple of instances where something you thought was going to be one way isn't quite what you expected. And then it's quite, I mean, as a reviewer, sometimes it's quite hard to figure out a, a path through a review because you've got to kind of try and make it cognitive and, and, and hang together. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of disparate statements, right? Yes. And, you know, but it is really important to flag the things that aren't right about something sure. and to do it in a way which isn't too condemning because that might. You know, I mean, I got really weird ways I like to work, and when things don't, you know, <laughs> come to me, I can sometimes get a little bit down on it. But you know, but a lot of people won't work that way. I mean, Native Instruments Machine is the thing that straight away jumps to mind when you think about that. You, it's an incredible device. It does loads of things, but it's really doggedly avoids working in certain ways. And then, and, and, and kind of what I mean by that is a certain expectation that it'll be able to manipulate stuff like Ableton Live. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll try and keep this concise. But so when you come on to it, because, you know, you, you might be familiar with things like Ableton Live, you go to work on it and it, oh, well, why can't it do this? Why can't it do this? Because it's not Ableton Live, you know. But people who haven't got the experience of Ableton Live come to it, they haven't got that kind of expectation from it. So from a reviewing point of view, it's just really important to to flag these things so people are aware. Yeah. Yeah, of, no, I agree of with where that. they are, and and what you may perceive as a criticism isn't necessarily a criticism. A criticism, you know, or, or sorry, it, what you might perceive as a fault isn't necessarily a fault of the product. It's just that it's not for Different. you, you know. Yeah, yeah, I would I would draw people's attention to the electron stuff, which I thought sounded absolutely amazing. Personally, I couldn't get on with the analog four because the screen is so small, I cannot see it. You know? Me too. So you know, and I did say that, but. I, admittedly, I'd I, I'm, on a screen. I'm older and, uh, and my eyesight is not as good as it was. But nonetheless, from a you know, that means it's not going to work for everybody. So you know, I don't know. Speaking of small really screens, so Nick, yeah, you did. You know, um, just very very quickly, we saw uh, that that Parva that we talked about is on uh, the Parva Polyphonic Synth is on Kickstarter yeah, at the moment. It and is. What's quite interesting about that is is that you can buy it with a single voice, or then you can buy it with as many voices as you want. So it's like $499 for the mono one, and then $100 per card. Per voice. Oh, right, so you put yeah. cards in it. Okay, that's interesting. It's kind of like the mutable instruments yeah. kind of model, isn't it, where you can add up to six, is that right? With the, I forget the name of the... Is it um, Shruti, Ambika? I can't remember. They've got uh, unusual um, Indian goddess mm -hmm. names, from what I recall. <laughs> But uh, um, Well, uh, let's... While we're out on the subject, perhaps, of uh, Kickstarter... Look at that. What a link, man. I should do this for a living. <laughs> this is the um, uh, Artifon, which uh, has a very... I've never uh, seen this thing before. This is basically... A counter uh, that's just fine. It's basically, what I can tell, it's a guitar controller that they're touting as something that is not just a guitar controller. They've got a beautifully made uh, Kickstarter uh, video, which seems to be all the, the rage these days. And uh, it looks like, basically, you get those little buttons are the strings, so you strum them. And then the fretboard is the guitar side of it. I mean, I think they're kind of overplaying perhaps the fact that it's it's not a guitar, it's something else. It's drum pads, it's a keyboard, because obviously that is a kind of guitar-based interface. But what's amazing about this, We're really excited. they've raised over a million bucks on Kickstarter, which is... I just can't quite get my head around this. I mean, that is just an astonishing amount of stuff for what is essentially a kind of weird... And well, in fact, what I thought it was... Let me just... Uh, I found a, a kind of comparison, and that is uh, this guy here. This is the... Uh, where is it? Photo enlargement. This is the Yamaha EZAG, which is kind of a very similar thing, except it actually has string strings and it has buttons on the on there i mean i'm sure you could probably use it you know if you connected it up to something else because this thing the artifon is just a controller but to me it's mind-blowing that they've they've done this i wonder if it's i just i can't quite get my head around it has anyone kind of um managed it? i mean no gaz you're very keen on you know new groundbreaking sort of interfaces what have you what do you make of this 
Well, I mean, the first thing it brings to mind, I think, is uh, it's like a kind of um, a watered down Eigenhart for the masses, isn't it? You know, in, 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 in some respects, <laughs> you know. Wow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, yeah. Well, no, uh, yes and no. Perhaps. I mean, the uh, I think the Iron yeah. Heart was had a bit more cre- uh, um, sensors and stuff on it. Hold on, I'm just going to bring. Yeah, hence watered, up. hence watered yes, down. But you know, in terms of it being, uh, a, you know, a device that you can apply very, you know, varying musical uh, expression on, you know, and holding it in certain ways and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, this one. It's clearly done well on Facebook because it just it's just very corporate. Everything about it, the video, the presentation, the look of it, you know, it's actually Cute priced. Kids, beautiful women. Yeah. 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 Hipsters. And it's priced very reasonably. <laughs> and I think that they've managed to get the marketing Beach. right where it's gone to sort of, you know, not the sonic state kind of market. You know, they've gone into a, you know. It's a, a entertainment market. It is kind of interesting. Sorry, Rich. <laughs> I said a home entertainment market, which on some level makes yeah, sense home for home entertainment market. Like that, That's a because it brought way of saying it. for sales. I mean, it's like more like the home organ market than it is like the market that spawned the Moog modular. If you're, if you know what I'm saying. So uh, yeah, it, it is that. Um, and is it fun? Is it a fun toy for people? Is really what it boils down to. And does it fall within a reasonable price point for people who want a fun toy like that? What if I'm not a musician? There we go. Yes, you're, you're quite right there, Rick. It is, but it's an interesting notion that something, again, you know, something that is essentially like quite a specialised controller has reached, has broken out that sort of typical kind of ghetto of, you know, music technology that we generally inhabit. Um, but you need an iPad, by the looks of it, really, to get the most of it. I don't know what the MIDI connectivity is. Uh Exactly. But pretty much has everybody has something that's going to create some kind of sound. You could probably connect that thing to and make it work. Yeah, I'm sure you're probably Chances right. Chances are. I like Chances the idea are. of the strummable thing and the to throw in the shapes. I mean, because I, I always fancy the idea of those easy, of the Yamaha Easy guitar, which I must say was quite bendy. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a lower. It's only a few hundred quid, but this uh, this thing is is a little bit more. Uh, is in the same ballpark. It looks like it's slightly better built, but even though a shorter neck wide. But again, it's on some level, and somebody pointed this out in the chat room, it's competing with the Lindstrument on some level, which is a much more expensive and probably much more advanced device that similarly you're touching an electronic surface to generate uh, various kinds of control data. Yeah. I think I think they're going for the – all of those people, like my daughter, you know, came home from school wanting a ukulele and now learns kind of loads of pop songs on the ukulele. And, you know, this is the sort of – it's almost that kind of – Kind of thing. I know, uh, Mark. You've but, got. You've got. Uh, I'm sorry, sorry Go ahead, Rich. Have at it. No, no. Have at it, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like a bit. I mean, anything that allows you to play things in a different way could be cool, right? I tend to. I mean, I love new controllers, and no one ever thinks that because I speak out against controllers. Because, and this is probably an elitist thing that everyone will hate, but. I really think for you to access the creative part of your brain, there needs to be some sort of learning and interface with the creative part of your brain. And when you create a device that anyone can play, it means that there isn't going to be any actual learning taking place with that interface in your brain. And so anything that anyone can play is basically kind of a toy. So I always encourage like the concept that like, yeah, this thing is not like, not everyone can play this, but if you really apply yourself, you probably can play it. So that sort of thing. And I don't know if that's the exact case with this instrument, but I mean, I'm, I struggle with guitar a lot. I really like it, but it's really hard for me. So when I work with a guitar, I come up with uh, ideas that I think are really creative that probably aren't. But uh, with this, I'm like, well, <laughs> guitars aren't easy to play. So I, I, I applaud that, but then I wonder if there aren't functions in it that like, okay, you don't have to learn or do anything. You just have to, you know, strum it and it'll make nice noises for you or something like that. Which I guess I would that's be... going to, that was probably down to the software. I'd imagine that you stick on the other end of it. I mean, because as we know, you know, GarageBand allows you to have a, you can use the strumming action, but it'll f- stay, you know, on, on message or in pitch or in the kind of, tu- you know, so th- those sort of, accept- I mean, I could see maybe you, you partner this up with something like GarageBand. And I don't know whether or not, the mid- it'd be interesting to know about the MIDI modes, whether or not it does, you know, channel per note and all of those kind of things that, so you could use it in a more advanced way. Because, I mean, it's great that this is, ra- I mean, they weren't only really wanting to raise 
seventy-five thousand bucks only. I say, so you know they've exceeded this by an enormous, you know, a factor of what a, a thousand? Is that right? <laughs> I mean, that's kind of like, that's kind of unheard of. So these guys must be. I mean, I guess, but I guess even with a startup, you know, that's that's got to build hardware and stuff, a million bucks isn't exactly, you know isn't a lot of money i mean you could burn through mm-hmm. it pretty big if you've got a, a a a large media team and you know various people on the board and what have you i don't know a lot a lot of people who shared it on my facebook were not the sort of people who would typically be interested in that sort of thing so maybe that's a key as well to its uh I think the key, I think well. the key was the the cute girl, the little girl who was <laughs> who who would say, you know, would you like what have one of these at school? And like, yeah, it'd be awesome. And she was just impossibly cute and fantastic to watch <laughs> her reaction to it. But they've obviously very cleverly it's been very cleverly made, the marketing, hasn't it? You know, and that, and I think that's the key to a lot of these things. It just feels like I feel like there's something something else that, you know, this feels sinister. yeah sinister dave it's maybe it's maybe it's my maybe, yeah, i think you did you know, it's my british my british cynicism but well, I, I i get cynical about things like this because when like I, i've seen so many of these kickstarter things where they've all got these glorious premises and there's beautiful shining light and they're all kind of hipster dudes and dudesses and stuff like that and i'm like why do you that need just the money? shows how disconnected i am from real life if that's assuming that is real life because um, I like, you know, men in basements and sheds and stuff like that, beavering away, tinkering away and kind of forging paths and doing all this kind of stuff in dimly lit rooms with perhaps small windows. And it all seems so glamorous on Kickstarter. You know, I'd be more receptive to handing over money if somebody was on Kickstarter going, I really, really want to do this and I promise I'll work really, really hard at it and I'd really like an office with a window. <laughs> and I'd be like, yeah, yeah, give them some money. Whereas this is all kind of like, everything's just so glam. I know what well, you're saying. Well, I think that has to do with that. I think it's largely a marketing thing because basically everything these days is geared towards the average of people so that the most of them can sell. So when you have someone who's creating an instrument, okay, so like I have this stupid additive synthesizer idea. I yell at everyone no matter what. But the fact of the matter is the average person doesn't want an additive synthesizer and they wouldn't like what they'd have to go through to get one and it would be too expensive. So anybody with any sense marketing-wise would go, yeah, that's stupid. But the people who invent amazing musical instruments don't start from what's going to be marketable. They, They come up with a beautiful idea and they pursue it. And I have to say, like, the Moog Modular was not a great idea. No one understood it. Who would ever make this? But Bob had to make it, and he did. And then, you know, what came from there came from there. And I think these days, a lot of these instruments that are being made, some marketing person is saying, everyone needs to be able to play this. And everyone in your marketing for it needs to be beautiful. They need to align with this sort of philosophy. And we need to make it so that anyone... From any skill level to any skill level, because that's what will sell it, yeah. and that's what I think is the sinister. <laughs> I suppose so. The sinister the aspect. Sinister aspect. You. Yeah. Th- there is. There is a. There is. One knows when one's being marketed to. I suppose rather than natural rich. Sorry. But sales has always been this way. Audio yeah. oh, gear yeah. has always been sold with music. Food appli- food creation appliances are always sold on the basis of the food that's going to come out of the thing. That's just, and you know, the little, the happy little girl in your living room playing away on the thing happily. You know, is just that's the they're trying to work backwards from a perceived end result, and that's just how marketing. Yeah, goes. well, I guess. So. Do you remember like at Christmas all those games? Like when we were kids, like we'd see all those games like Kaplunk and stuff like that, and you'd think, oh, that's amazing. This took me years to ricochet. This, by the way. Yeah, well, Ricochet was awesome, as was Crossfire. <laughs> but, uh, Crossfire! And uh, Battling Tops. But let's not go there. The, the whole concept is like all the adverts would show like groups of kids having fun playing this game. And you'd think, subliminally, you would think, I want, if I, I get that. that thing, I would have lots of friends. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and the truth fun. is, That's it was silly. just you playing it on your own, going, oh, it's really not that much fun, is it? It's re- what's but really listen. interesting about that is if you, if you take that concept to sort of modular... The very anti, you know, the more modular, more you get into modular, the less likely you are to have friends because you won't have any time for them. You won't have any, you know, you'll be obsessed sitting there in your room just kind of doing, which is great and exploratory, and that's a great thing to have, but you need the other side of it. I suppose the thing is that with something like this, is it, it, it it feels like there's probably a really great engineer in there somewhere who's hooked up with a really great 
conceptual marketing and whatever team and they've just gone right let's here we go you know and and, that, and i suppose in many ways that's kind of what you want in many ways if you come up with a great idea for a, say an additive synth mark and you met somebody like you know i know who was able to take that and go i know how to market this i know how to make it into mold it into something that people will actually want then that would be great. I mean, it might not feel like it was so much your idea anymore, but it would probably end up <laughs> end up there, you know, I suppose. <laughs> My name would but, be associated with it, and it wouldn't do what I wanted or liked, but at least it would be sold. <laughs> Which is, on some level, the legacy of Bob Moog realized. <laughs> oh, once totally, again. totally. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because there came a point in the middle there, like around the time of the liberation, and where uh, other people were making these scents under his name. Yeah, absolutely. Some very, very talented and wonderful people, by the way. Um, so I'm not trying to be... Yep. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's the brand. The brand is very powerful in many people's, uh, you know, it's this sort of holy grail of stuff. This is getting a little bit off topic, I suppose, but, you know, it's it's all interesting. But this, this kind of you looks... I think there was a topic in there somewhere, but if you want to check it out, uh, let me see. It's called the that Artifon. That, little, that was that plastic thing that looks... Yeah, that's like right. This thing. Yeah, we should come back on. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Look, there are really happy people sitting on their massive sofa with an iPad jamming along. <laughs> Wow. That's a this, you know what? This, the bed with this the is thing. all a conspiracy. Beware, everyone. This is a conspiracy. This artifact, what it is, is it makes music so extremely accessible and easy to play, and all the family can have it. But the music you play is Muzak. And any ideas that you're festering in your mind of revolution eradicated. just gets just eradicated <laughs> by this kind of happy Muzak family. No, you That's could be wrong. Right. Do, do you think there could be? You could get. Ploy I'm just going to. I'm just in their place. I'm just going to check actually to see if there's like a partridge family package on the uh, <laughs> on the on the I back. Know of... If she comes with the instrument. No. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> That's an interesting point. But uh, yeah, but we could, why, why can't we do this? We we're all reasonably intelligent people. We could do this. Look, they got a million dollars. Yeah, well, they are committing to make <laughs> actually make. Let's just get a load of hipsters. You need this card, this empty cardboard box. Like, just get the right hipsters. <laughs> Nice if I buy this, if I buy this, will I be able to have a couch that big? Yeah, no, you it come. It, you certainly will. I think that's yeah, yeah. part of the. You're likely to have a couch that big, or be considering getting a couch that big if you buy this. Maybe from the sort of broader marketing reach of this. Anyway, I think we've been a little unkind, but it looks like kind of it's probably <laughs> quite good. I'd just I'm like to know a little bit more about how it works. But uh, yeah, it's, I think I think that the, perhaps the, the message here is. I don't know what it is. We all, is it is it that we're perhaps so, also kind of like uncomfortable with things moving out? This is our thing, you know. Don't don't mm. we don't want other things polluting it. It's our <laughs> music thing. We don't want kind of you know the uh, the larger the wider audience getting a piece of it and making it rubbish. Anyway, <laughs> that's just. I want, Dave, I want Dave to narrate the sales video. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> if you could make it just like your Christmas video, Dave. Yeah, yeah. which yeah. which sell. Oh yeah, just miserable and yes, bleak. Yeah. Oh, lost a bit of bandwidth <laughs> in the bleak. Bleak, but with nice chords. Hey, I've got one for you in the in the bleak <laughs> midi winter. Great soundtrack. I'm here all week. I think we're probably uh, this 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 uh, gathering is probably reaching its uh, its natural <laughs> end. Right. Well, just uh, what, going. Yeah, well, I, I, I've got to go and uh, drain my nose, so I, I'm not sure that I want to do that live, uh, live on, on the show. Hello. I'm starting to fill up. It's the decongestant I took just before. But I'll say thank you very much to everybody for joining us. It's been fantastic. Um, before we go, I just want to quickly remind you of uh, our sponsors, and then I'll say goodbye to everybody. Remember, if you want to win Isotope Iris 2, which is uh, available for a giveaway this week, um, hashtag sound painting one word at sonic state at isotope Inc., which means you will need to do it on twitter but it's uh, it's quite painless and obviously 140 characters available on a tweet put something else in there as well we'd like to see it we always enjoy your comments anyway thank you very much for joining us my panel i'm going to start with uh mr rich hilton over there because i know the time's changed is it earlier or later for you there or are we caught up i can't quite figure out what time is it in the u.s where you are it's 20 past noon right now. So, ah, okay. what, so seven hours. But it's resumed the normal five hour time difference between where I am and where you are, right. rather than the four hour time difference we had for the preceding month. Right, I got you. Yes, we're now in British summertime and uh, 
the fair mm-hmm. is in town, so it must be summer or Easter anyway. <laughs> but Rich, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, great. Uh, I hope uh, your uh, uh, the, the the single does well and the album is all going to work out. And I think, thank you very much for joining us. And remember, go and check out the Chic single and buy it. And get let's get it to number one on whatever chart it is that reflects that kind of stuff these days. I guess it's the iTunes chart, isn't it? But Anyway, thank you, Rich. Great pleasure to have you aboard as well. And okay, we'll also get over to Dave Spears over there, G4 Software. Thank you, Dave, for joining us. Uh, I'm glad um, you are uh, back and also feeling a little bit better because I know you've had the cold as well. Thank you very much. Great fun. Good, uh, great, and also Mr. Gaz Williams. Thank you for joining us this week, Gaz. Your your video is yeah. looking awesome. Have you had your band? Have you had your bandwidth seen too? You're looking very uh, high high fidelity. <laughs> it's an illusion. <laughs> hey, um, uh, Roland Island Mark Ira Modular. <clears throat> uh, sorry, um, uh, Roland Ira Modular. Oh yes, there was that whole thing, wasn't there? I I would like to say before we go <laughs> that um, the the photos that were posted on the Facebook group of some Roland stuff in a room with a load of modular things that you couldn't really tell what it was I posted that and I put it as a story and I got contacted by the poor guy who'd accidentally posted them and he said please please can you help me I'm not supposed to post any photos from that particular event could you take them down which is why I took them down because it wasn't like I wasn't being leaned on by any corporate people I took it down (laughs) because he was really quite distressed and I didn't want to actually kind of you know I didn't want him to to get any worse. Anyway, I don't know, Rich. What are you <laughs> saying? What What are you saying? Do you not believe that story? He seemed like pretty upset, to be perfectly honest. But <laughs> I don't know uh, either way what it signifies. But I could tell from the photos there wasn't really much you could see. Some people thought it was going to be, and I I can't remember. There's a there's another synth that I think Aunt Roland Ira distributing that has also got green bits on it, and people were thinking it was just that. So. There you go, Gaz. I hope that's... <laughs> One last it. thing. One last thing, because it is time dependent. Some people have been asking, what's, what's the latest thing I've bought? Well, this is something that's worth knowing about. Ikea are selling off these these like foot shelves. I think it's the Linden or... The, or Stol- oh, I can't remember what it's called. But look, um, here... Uh, let me flip my camera. Uh-huh. I've got... the. Strike fet to be returned. Look, these are foot. These are these are like um, they're for shoes. Ah, but see, but they they're, they're perfect for synthesizers. Yeah, they're really good for like little gadgety sort of synths, which um, I'm partial to. He really, wow. <laughs> they're really helpful because you just put them on a keyboard stand. Oh, hang on, I got to do this now. Haven't I? Oh no, I'm gonna shoe shelf. I'm gonna. I'm searching while you're doing this, just so if you can. <laughs> ikea linden shoe yeah. shelf okay i see what you're doing yeah 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 that makes perfect sense and they do a special offer in the uk are they Hold on. <laughs> they're selling them off they're four quid each <laughs> shoe shelf oh uh, i don't s- oh. no uh is it a compliment shoe shelf no nope. that's not it <laughs> damn this live um this live thing isn't working quite well, quite working out quite so well on the IKEA thing. But thanks for the tip, no, guys. It's just that I mean, it, it it was just I thought it was such a cool little way of dealing with a perennial problem of small modular or yeah, small modular things on a shelf. Absolutely, I'm trying to find the, the URL. I'm sorry, maybe guys can find it. I would like okay. to say though, Stolman, with, Stolman. Uh, with it being bank holiday, if you've ever been to IKEA on a bank holiday weekend. You know, it, it's probably worth paying 10 times more than actually having to go <laughs> to Ikea on a bank holiday weekend. But, you know, I th- what's it called? Colden. Let's see if we can find it. St- Stolman. Stolman. They've got some great names. They've usually got sort of, they're almost slightly rude. But this one isn't. Stolman? No. Stolman. It's like a... Two ends? It's like a modular system. You can make these wardrobes with these poles and you put these shoe racks on there. But you can make a whole uh, kind not, of... It's not showing up for me, Gaz. I'm sorry. I can't oh, find it. I, I, How I'll do you spell it? it? This is Stole men. Stoll. <laughs> S-T-O-L-M-E-N. Oh, okay. That's probably what it is. You guys are in uh, shelf uh, heaven. Stole. Right. I, well, you know, storage, luggage, both things that I enjoy very well. Okay, I found them. Here we go. Stolman. <laughs> there's an entire... Oh, there's so many of them. Stolman shelf. 15 bucks. 15... Oh, this is... I'm in IKEA US. 
Uh, I don't know why that is. Anyway, you can get you can get like a whole you can get these poles. <laughs> That's about and like four quid nowadays, and you good. can make a custom studio for synths with them. And they Excellent. were like, yeah, I was I was blown away by how cool it worked. And just, you live yeah. just around the corner from IKEA, so you can just keep going down and getting another one and getting another one and getting another one. <laughs> Excellent. Anyway, yeah. I'm going to say goodbye to Mark now, Mark Doty. It's been a pleasure having you aboard. Thank you very much for joining us. I would love to have you on again if you are available. I know this is in the middle of your working day, but, um, you know. I'm I'm sure something could be figured out. Thank you for having me, Nick. I don't know if many of you know this, but I pretty much got... Nick kind of gave me my start way back when I was uh, just a guy who talked loudly about stuff on the internet. <laughs> and uh, so it's it's nice to be back and be, be here. And it's also nice to meet all of you in person. I know I'm Facebook friends with all of you guys and have talked to you on various levels. Uh, newly Gaz, it was nice to meet you. And thank you very much for the kind words that you have had about me. But it was great to like actually talk to you guys in a social situation that wasn't Text. Excellent. Well, you can't be face to face, even if it's kind of virtual, and that's that's part of the fun of this whole thing. You never know where it's going to go, or where it's been, or where it's going to head up. But uh, just before we go, Bob Moog, uh, the Moog Foundation org is probably where you want to go. For some reason, I've got Bob Moog Foundation, but Moog Foundation org is is kind of will work so do go and check it out anyway that's pretty much it for this week thank you very much everybody for watching thanks to our show sponsors uh we will be back next week where uh, we'll have a pre music messer uh kind of conflab uh then there will be no show on the week of music messer though i'm recording an interview uh tomorrow with the guys from isotonic studios uh, who build a load of Macs for live devices and stuff, so that should be interesting. Anyway, that's it for now. I'm going to fade to black and stop recording. See you later.